fellow music nerds. Welcome to Season 2 of the Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast. I am your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a Canadian guitarist, songwriter, producer, and engineer, and I've been living and working here in Nashville for the last four years. A couple of years back, I decided to reach out to some of the amazing musicians, engineers, and producers I've met along the way to learn some of their more in-depth stories than what I'd been hearing elsewhere. So between March and August of this year, I'll be releasing a new conversation every Wednesday with someone who I feel has been involved with creating great recorded music. Feel free to reach out to me or leave comments at www.stevedawson.ca and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast for free on iTunes. Now, let's get down to another episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. Hey folks, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever it may be. Welcome to another episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers, coming to you from Vancouver, BC, where I am making an album. This week, I get to do something that's always a real thrill, and that is to have a conversation with an icon from the earliest generation of rock and roll. Last season, I got to do that once with Dwayne Eddy. Um, If you haven't checked out that episode yet, please go and have a listen. It was a two-part episode because we ended up blabbing for a long time. But this week, I get to speak with the one and only Mr. Ronnie Hawkins. So for me and my musical cronies, when I was growing up, pre-internet, yes, I'm an old geezer, my friends and I would all bootleg VHS copies of music movies that came on late night TV, and we'd swap them around. And these fourth generation videos sounded pretty crappy. But through those crappy sounding and wobbly imaged videos, I got to see a number of bands and musicians and concerts that changed my life. I must have watched them a hundred times each. There was, uh, for me, there was a documentary about Jimi Hendrix called, I think it was called the Jimi Hendrix movie. That was really killer. Uh, The Farewell Cream concert, that was a big one. Rain Dogs by Tom Waits. Woodstock, which I had to fast forward through a lot of, but um, there's some great footage in there of some music. The Hendrix footage in that at the end is incredible. Uh, And then one that kind of reached epic proportions for me and all my group of friends, which was The Last Waltz. And I don't really need to go on about the merits of that movie. If you're a fan of this show, I'm sure you've seen that movie. Uh, If you haven't, you probably need to go out and do that now. First and foremost, The Last Waltz was a movie about a, uh, a, a group made up largely of good old Canadian boys called The Band. And uh, aside from the killer concert footage, there were also interviews done by Martin Scorsese uh, hanging out with the fellas, and it told the story of their exploits. And a lot of those were um, of their early days as members of the Hawks under the watchful eye of Ronnie Hawkins. And uh, Ronnie is a, an Arkansas native who emerged in the late 50s rockabilly and rock and roll scene alongside Elvis and Wanda Jackson and Carl Perkins and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and that whole crew. He uh, somehow, well through a series of events, found a very welcoming scene going on in Canada uh, at that time, or in the in the you know early 60s. And uh, he really enjoyed that because it was somewhere that he could go to get these long gigs, like week-long or two week-long gigs, and uh, really be able to work on his band and his music while not having to drive every night to the next gig which is what he had to do when he was in the States. So while he was in Canada, he gradually picked up the cream of the crop of the the young musicians, uh, all of them being under 20. Uh, Aside from Levon Helm, the rest of them were all Canadian kids, and they would form the Hawks, which later became the band. And uh, Ronnie's appearance at the last waltz was the first time I'd heard of him. You know, I was probably 14 or 15 checking out the last waltz, and and, uh, there's Ronnie Hawkins, and he made a huge impression on me. And I picked up his albums um, and learned more about about his story. Uh, he kept recording um, really cool records through the 70s and 80s. And he's also 
you know, been a training ground for really great musicians. Not, of course, all the, the band guys are, are the most famous ones, but um, also David Foster, weirdly, has been through his band, which you'll hear about in this interview. Um, other people, he's been playing with the Weber Brothers, um, who are a fantastic band as well. That's more recent. So he's always got his eye on, on young talent and, and, and scouting musicians, which is really a, a cool thing about what he does. Ronnie made a home for himself in Ontario, and he's lived there ever since. And I was put in touch with him through my friend Gary Craig, who's a wonderful drummer from, from Toronto, and uh, his friend Eve Canizo. Eve is a, a filmmaker, and she had been doing a documentary that Ronnie was being interviewed for and got to know Ronnie and his lovely wife, Wanda. And she put me in touch with Wanda uh, to set this up to speak with Ronnie. So I greatly appreciate Gary and Eve for making that contribution. Anyway, Ronnie was happy to oblige me with an hour of his time and uh, it was a real thrill and a lot of laughs. He's old school and funny as hell. Thank you again for listening and tuning in as always. You can connect with me and the show at stevedawson.ca. You can make contributions there to the show. It is the only uh, way that we collect any money to uh, make the show happen and pay for the expenses that we have. So I appreciate that. And uh, while you're at it, please subscribe to the show for free on iTunes. And that helps us out as well. And now, without further delay, here's my conversation with the great Ronnie Hawkins. Hello. Hi, Ronnie. How are you, man? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just laying around dreaming of stardom. Okay. <laughs> it's just it's just steps away, I'm sure. <laughs> dreaming of my name in lights. Like the first two or three years, my name was many others. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, dare and to dream, others. man. Dare to dream. I almost changed my name to and many others. That way people would think I'm working everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for thinking of me because I need all the help I can get. <clears throat> We're going to Vancouver here pretty quick. David Foster's having his big, big, big show oh. in, in uh, Vancouver. He's been, I think, it's 30 years or something. Oh. He's, he's, he's done real good. You, you, know, you know, David was in my band, David Foster. I, I did not know that, actually. Really? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I had to fire him. He tried to he put too many. In, he tried to put two chords in Bo Diddley. <laughs> that's a terrible mistake. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> I told him I said Paganini wouldn't want anybody messing with his compositions. He's been back this around everywhere, and we've been making interviews together. So he's helped us a lot. Yeah. He, he did an interview, uh, a big show. I, I don't know if it was Johnny Carter. I, mean, I saw him. And he, he just made two hundred and fifty or sixty million that year. He was the highest paid <laughs> producer in the world at that time. Slow year for and, him. <laughs> oh, he's he's doing okay for a country boy. But I might be able to find a musician somewhere as good as him. But he could drive a bus better than anybody. Really? He drove my bus. <laughs> That's a good feature, man. <laughs> in an interview, he said he said he learned more mm -hmm. in the Ronnie Hawkins band that he did in all the other bands put together, but it didn't have anything to do with music. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know whether that was good or bad. I think that's good. <laughs> Those are the kind of skills you need in life, man. I don't know what they are exactly. But <laughs> um, what, what year would he have been in your band? Like in the 70s? Yeah, 70s. Oh, no yeah, kidding. And he, he ended up marrying uh, my female lead vocalist, B.J. Cook. Okay. And they had a little daughter, that, and she's supposed to be making, you know, 50 million a month now, big time. He put her in every school there was to oh, yeah. learn how to write and all that stuff. Okay. And so David's really, really done well. He's He has to, though. He's been married about five times, so he ha he's like Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> he has to keep working. <laughs> um, <laughs> where did where did you find that guy? Was he, was, he a, was he BC originally, or was he in Ontario? <laughs> No, I'll tell you how I found David. I, I, I put a bunch of bands together because in those days, you know, they didn't stay long because that was a drug area, you know, and right. they'd stay in long enough to buy a bunch of drugs and they'd start messing up and after a year or so, and then I just changed. I needed to keep changing anyway because, see, I was staying in one spot. Uh -huh. So you got to change everything, songs, everything to stay there. And so there's a great musician in Edmonton. I don't know if you uh, uh, Tommy Banks. Yeah, sure, of course. Have you, have you heard that name? Yeah, totally, of course. Yeah. Well, he's a wonderful, and he's he he ran his wife at that time uh, ran a booking agency, mm -hmm. and and I was going out there checking everything out, and 
I went to Tommy. I said, Tommy, I need somebody. I always hire, try to hire somebody in the band that is really good at reading, writing, teaching music. Yep. Like Garth Hudson, like Garth, I brought yeah. in uh-huh. to teach the band, you know, how right. to read. And, and boy, after about a year, they were so good that the music that they shot me by me like a bowl of lightning. <laughs> that rockabilly country it wasn't good enough for them anymore. They weren't getting that something that had three chords. Yeah, man. <laughs> 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 but, Who uh, needs it? but anyway, <laughs> David was playing trombone, I think, in his band. I, well, he wasn't playing piano. But oh. anyway, he, he recommended David, and then David used some unbelievable musicians that he knew in Van, Vancouver. Yeah. And he, he put together a band for me, and we rehearsed out there and played out there a little bit. Really? But uh, we came back to Toronto, and he kept, but he had the, he put together the slickest band. Uh-huh. I mean, these guys would make Crosby, Still, Nash, and Young look like rank amateurs. I'm not kidding <laughs> you. He was strong. But it was too slick for a bar. Yeah, that's you some know? slick shit, man. Yeah. It's like jazz in a bar, some bars, you know. Yeah. They don't go over. Yeah. And, and of course, they weren't showmen. They they looked like they just found out their mother had just died every day. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's where I got that saying. I looked up on the stages. It looked like a bunch of cadavers up there. <laughs> <laughs> he tells that story now and then, too. Yeah. But he's he's doing real, real good. And he's he's doing, doing all right. Yeah, yeah. He ain't doing bad for a B.C. boy or yeah, Victoria, man. I guess. You're going out to Vancouver? Uh, when is that going to be? I think it's the uh, end of this month. I'm not sure. I took Gordon Lightfoot to see one here in Toronto, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd never seen Gordon do this in my life. He got up and started doing uh, one of his great songs, and he got to moving around and walked up on stage and walked back and forth and everything. I never seen wow. him yeah, ever he's, do he's, that. He's usually pretty uh, pretty steady up there. He doesn't. Well, really he, move he just stands there and does about a, an hour and a half, two hours of hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told everybody, uh, Jesus, it takes Jesus and the original disciples. To do get as many people in as he does at Massey Hall. <laughs> Boy, he, he still sells it out five nights. Yeah, man. Yeah, he does he, well. He people love him. You know, he's... Florida. They had to put special seats in for us because yeah. he'd sold out in Florida. Really? He sells out everywhere. That's amazing, man. Yeah. It, 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 it's you... amazing. He was out in the house. He and Chris Christopherson uh-huh. and Willie Nelson and I got together and we sung a little, sung Bobby McGee just for fun. Yeah. And it, it, it came out, you know, not not real bad, but to, uh, Chris's wife put it on that, what do you call it, where you, where you listen to songs? Uh, 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 you mean like on YouTube or something? Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that, something like that, whatever it was. And it got a little airplay. Yeah. And now they want to do, do another one, so we're going to do another one. Are you really? Gonna, oh, cool. I, I did one of Gordon's songs called... Uh, well, I don't know if you knew this. I, I recorded a Gordon Lightfoot song, I don't know, a thousand years ago, and it became number one in Canada. It's called Home from the Forest. Yeah. And, th- and that was before Gordon ever had a top 50 song in Canada yet. So how did you know that song? He, because I knew Gordon. We ran around a little bit. He, he, he was a fan for a while. Him and Ian and Sylvia yep. used to come in the bars all the time. Right, right. And, of course, they were all... Uh, Bob Dylan fans. I I didn't even heard of Bob Dylan then. Yeah. And then I got to meet him later on because my band went with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, my band went with Bob. They sure did. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you about your growing up in Arkansas. Um, you know, like what what was going on around there, and what exact town you were from, and uh, you know, as a kid, like what kind of music you were listening to and stuff like that. Can you tell me a bit about growing up? Oh yeah. Well, you know, my my dad. Uh, was, the Hawkins side of my family were, were kind of musical. Yeah. And and he, when he was a kid, he had him and his three brothers formed a band called the Hawkins Brothers. Okay. And they and they played, you know, everywhere for I don't know for a few years around. And uh, finally they broke up. But my uncle Delmer, he was the youngest one. Uh-huh. He was super musical inclined. He was very very gifted, and he went on to do really, really good in music. I mean, he, he played with a lot of big-time bands and stuff, and he learned how to read and write music and all that stuff. Was he a, was he an instrumentalist? Yeah, yeah, guitar player, guitar and, player, and he yeah. could play just about anything, but okay. he was mainly a guitar player and, and, and did some singing. But his son, many years later, uh, that was Dale Hawkins that wrote Suzy Q. Yeah, yeah. So you're cousins with Dale, right? Yeah, I'm first cousin. That's my first cousin. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I got two guitar players off of Dale when he decided to quit 
playing and, and got into the business end of uh, music. Really? So that's and they were uh, they were two giant musicians too. Uh, uh, Fred Carter, have you ever heard that name? Yes, yes. He he became after he left me. He became the highest paid session man in Nashville. Yeah, and then he. They put him in charge of a record company, uh -huh. and then he played special sessions for everybody. And that's him on Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water oh. and The Boxer. I see him playing all the lead and the intros. Okay, that's yeah. Not, that's, not, that's not Paul. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just talked to um, Charlie McCoy for this show, and he was the harmonica player on the on Yeah, the sessions Charlie well. played three or four albums for me. Oh, cool. I saw him in Florida. I didn't recognize him now, but he, he, he Fred Carter, I mean, Fred Foster, excuse me, a monument. Yeah. Put an album out on Charlie. Yeah. I, I did my I did a couple of free albums for Monument and it was Chris Christopherson was a big star uh -huh. then, you know, and he was the one that saw me in Canada and taught Fred into giving me a job. Okay. But Fred discovered everybody. That's him doing all the Roy Oberson hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Um so so like you and your family like you and Dale and stuff, would you ever were you guys cl close as kids? Like, did you hang out? And no, no. You know, when 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 Susie Q first came out as Dale Hawkins, I didn't even know it was him. Really, his name is Delmer Allen. Okay, you know, like named after his dad. Okay, and they divorced, of course, early and moved to Louisiana. Yeah, and, and I didn't I hadn't heard from him. I saw him a couple of times visiting my grandmother at the same time. I went to see her, and we stayed there a couple of days, and I got to know him when we were very young. Yeah, and that was it. And all those years went by, and then I didn't hear from him at all. Uh -huh. And then I, I was learning songs for my little band, yeah. and we heard his song, Suzy Q, on, on the jukebox, and we really liked it, and I learned it. And you had no idea. Played it lo long before I knew it was my cousin that had done it. <laughs> That's crazy. Because I thought it was a, a black cat. Right, yeah. Back then, you know, if anybody had, did anything besides the country, they were black. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now you can't tell one from the other. I mean, this white kid sounds black, more black than black. <laughs> 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 but anyway, I was trying to, I was hustling every, everywhere I could yeah. to try to play. I used to have to buy drinks for a band so they'd let me get up and sing a couple of songs. Really? And yeah, oh yeah, I, I had to do that. I was just, I just wanted to show off, you know, and play. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, were there like dances, or like were these in bars, or what was the scenario? Well, where but there was bars. But see, my hometown, University of Arkansas, is in Fedville, Arkansas. Said and then, yeah, and of course the college kids, you know, fraternities and sororities, they have parties all the time. Yeah. And they book little bands. I was making, you know, maybe five dollars a night a man or something other like that, right. twenty five dollars. <laughs> sort of like now. <laughs> the big jobs were for uh, politicians, really? Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> really? But, but you, you had to be very careful because once they put a, a, a Republican or a Democrat pin on me, and, and then the uh, uh, Republicans wouldn't harm me. Right. They said, you're a Democrat. <laughs> I said, I ain't, I, I'm a... <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, that's why I never did get into politics. And I used to say all them big time stars, they shouldn't let anybody know what side they're on because the other side is, is going to hate you. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But anyway, yeah. I played around there with everybody that would come in. You know, Roy mm -hmm. Overson, I knew pretty good. Uh, he, he was before he hit big. He was from Texas, and called yeah. Roy and the Teen Kings. Really, and uh, they were an ugly bunch, but boy, they, they could play. Really, and then later on, he he got on Sun. You know, with uh, Ubi yeah. Doobie and Go Go Go, and we learned those songs right off the bat too. We was learning everything that came out of Sun because that was the style we wanted to do. Yeah, and then yeah. he kept everything going because of the university town. Okay, so do you remember who was who would have been in your, the very first incarnation of your band, or were people just coming and going all the time? We we, we played together for, for a long time, but but uh, they could only play on weekends uh -huh. because every one of them had jobs, and they wouldn't leave them jobs for what we were making. Right. We we just, we just you know we might probably making five dollars a night each or something or other, yeah. you know. But everybody wanted to play, but they couldn't leave. Uh, they couldn't travel. Right. I mean, we we go maybe a hundred miles from home, and that's it because. They couldn't leave their jobs. That was my very first band. Okay, and they're all they're they're all dead now. The, the last uh -huh. couple died just last year. Okay, they're gone. Yeah. And 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 then I I, I put a, a little group together. I went to Memphis. <clears throat> I, after I got out of the army, I got a phone call from a gentleman by the name of uh, Jimmy Ray Paulman. Yeah, Jimmy Ray had a reputation of being the best lead guitar player 
in Memphis. Yes. And he called me and said he, uh, he, because I'd gotten up and sung a couple of songs here and there with everybody that came through there, like Harold Jenkins and the Rockhousers, who later on became Conway Twitty, right. and Billy Lee Riley and all that bunch, uh-huh. they'd come through and I'd get up and sing a few songs with them. And most of the time, they'd hire uh, uh, Jimmy Ray to be the lead guitar player because they just picked, put a band together whenever they got a job, okay. which wasn't that often yeah. in those days. Yeah. <clears throat> and so he called me and said they had a, the session boys of, of Memphis put a band together and they wanted to hire me to be the front man, and they was going to pay me $100 a week Woo. in all expenses. Yeah, Boy, big time. Had nobody in the world made that much money. Big time. So the mistake I made was I told everybody in Arkansas, said, yeah, boys, are, the Memphis boys want me. I'm going to go down there in front for the station boys. Uh-huh. I told everybody, maybe some of them twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and the time I got loaded and headed for Memphis, which took about two days then, the band had broken up over who was going to be a leader. Oh. That's one of them intelligent things musicians do. You know, yeah, man. Tell me about when it. When you're young. And so I couldn't go home. Oh, uh, yeah. I'd already made a mistake telling right, everybody I was going right. to introduce them to Elvis. And <laughs> I wanted to tell us Oklahoma to introduce them to Elvis, and they wouldn't even let us go down to, to say hello. Really? So I, that was embarrassing. So how old were you at that point? Oh, I guess we was 17 or 18, I guess. Okay. I can't remember time. My mind is gone completely. Oh, that's okay. Uh, um, but anyway, when I got to Memphis, Jimmy Ray said, well, I, I, he, he, he had married a little girl from uh, Helena, Arkansas. Uh-huh. And so he said, I, I got a cousin that plays piano, and we'll go there and uh, put a little band together, and we'll start playing. out will get some good musicians. Okay. So I couldn't go home. So I, I went to Helena, Arkansas, yeah. and got a job working in a... Uh, at a place where they gave me a, a little room and board free yeah, and yeah. a couple of bucks, right? Right. And then we'd practice. Okay. Uh, but but then he found a, Will Pop Jones was his cousin's name, mm-hmm. and he uh, he he'd been playing two or three years. He was a piano player, and he'd uh, he knew of a little. We needed a drummer then, and he said he knew of a, a little drummer from. Uh, Oh, Arkansas, that what that little town. My mind's going out right now. I can't think of nothing. Uh, Helen, <laughs> outside of Helen, anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, his name was Levon Helm. Yeah. And and so, but Levon it wasn't a drummer. He wasn't. He didn't even want to set a drum. Really. He was a guitar player. Really. But he he, he had so much rhythm that that he set in every now and then with bands uh-huh. and and played drums. Okay. And so he did. He had that natural rhythm beyond belief, and he became. Uh, we started rehearsing yeah. and got good enough to start playing and played everything around, you know, locally within 50, 100 miles because his dad said that he ain't going to go on the road and play anywhere till he gets out of high school. <laughs> He'll be the only helm that ever graduated from high school. Oh, my God, all the pressure. Oh, it's Marvel, Arkansas. That's what I was trying to think Marvel. of. Marvel, right, okay. And, and I used to joke, say, even the teachers can't read and write in Marvel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's just a joke, you know. But, but that's what I used to tell everybody. But anyway, when he graduated, we we got you know pretty hot for the little bars. You know, where they were booking us, and you know we were making maybe ten dollars a night. Then we was in the big time. Uh huh. And then uh, I, we got a call from Canada, Mr. Harold Cutlets. Yeah. So he was he was like he was booking all the bands in on that circuit, right? I think he was the first one to start booking rockabilly and rock and roll in Canada because yeah. it wasn't hitting yet. Okay, that's why we got to uh, you know to, to play all the time because Chum Radio Station started playing it and baby we, we took off. Okay. We, 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 got, we we became a very popular band in in Ontario and around in Canada. So was that based on, like had you done recordings yet or was that just based on your live show? No, no, I, we hadn't done any, any recordings yet about anything. We'd done them the little things where you go and, well, like Elvis did, where you go and pay $5 and you, you, you sing a song. Oh, and you're okay. going to, you know, everybody's going to hear it. But but we got a chance to go audition yeah. with that band in uh, New York for three or four uh, different labels. Yeah. And, and uh, Roulette Records took us, and that was Mr. Morris Levy, yeah. who, was, who, who was the Hebrew gangster of, of Manhattan. You know, he was right. a big-time outlaw. Yeah. But uh, Levon was worried about signing with him because he'd heard that bad reputation, and he said, well, how long did you have to sign for? And I said, life was an option. <laughs> 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 so anyway, we put out a couple, three records, albums with, with them, and some of them did, you know, we got airplay anyway. 
that's what got us started in Canada. And you had that single with Hey Bo Diddley. Was that was that one of the first ones? It was, well, that was about the third one. Okay. And that had a lot of people don't know this, but that that wasn't Ricky Denko playing bass because he wasn't quite ready yet. Right. That's Roy Buchanan. Yeah, if you man. Know Roy Buchanan. Robbie learned a lot off of Roy Buchanan and Fred Carter and Jimmy Ray Palmer. They were all exceptionally good for their time. Okay. So so Roy was he was like around from around the DC area or something, right? Somewhere out there there. I never did know. I think he was originally from Arkansas. Oh okay. born there maybe. Yeah. But then the rumor was that he went to California and played there and then he settled in the, around Washington DC or somewhere, one of them states around there. Yeah. So, what's around what state is that around there? Virginia or yeah, there's a bunch of them. So that's Roy Buchanan on bass on Hey Bo Diddley. Yeah, that's Roy Buchanan. Very few people know that. Wow. But that's Roy, and that was our that was Robbie Robertson's first session. So he okay. So Robbie's on guitar on that. It's Robbie on guitar. It's the very first time he ever played, and he had some. If you listen to that old record today, uh, that guitar is, is still saying something. He it's he, killer, he yeah. hadn't peaked he hadn't peaked out yet, but he had that. I loved old Bo Diddley, you know, because of all yeah. the rhythms and stuff that yeah. he could play. Yeah. And uh, that record took off pretty good. In those early days, like in the late 50s, when you've got Levon in the band, but but before before the rest of the band guys were in your, your crew... Um, uh -huh, that was all Arkansas boys then. All Arkansas, okay. And and were you crossing paths with, with all the big rockabilly guys, like, you know, like Jerry Lee Lewis and, and Elvis and all that? I ran around with all of them. Jerry Lee, I ran around my whole life with. Really? You know, Carl, Carl Perkins. Johnny Cash was a car salesman. <laughs> really? And a bad one. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and Carl was a sharecropper. You know, he was out of Jackson, yeah. Tennessee. Yeah. His, his drummer, his old drummer, W.S. Holland, I still talk to him today. He's the only one left alive. Okay. And he, when Carl had the bad car accident, uh -huh. going to, he played that little club of mine in, uh, in Fedville. I think he got me about two hundred dollars mm -hmm. for playing that club, and then he was going to uh, 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 Springfield, Missouri, to play the Red Foley Show, which was a the only network country show going then. I think, yeah. and yeah. then he was going into Cal to New York to play uh, Perry Como, and that's when he had the bar bad car wreck. Oh wow! And, okay, and he couldn't play for a, a couple of years, and that's when W. S. Holland went with Johnny Cash. And became the Tennessee Three. Okay, right on. And he, and he was with Johnny for nearly forty years. Yeah, man, years. that was a hell, a hell of a gig. And, and, I, and, and a company I work for called Cambridge. I meet and greet. I got him a job for down there, and he's and he's really see he can remember things. I can't remember anything anymore. But but he <laughs> you seem to be he, doing okay. <laughs> yes, well, he you know, he told me he's the only cat I know. I know he was the only guy in Memphis. He never took a pill. He never took a drink of whiskey. Uh -huh. He never smoked a cigarette, and and never took any dope. The only musician down there I know for sure. Right. But he did tell me he said that if the doctors ever gave him you know like a month to live, he's going to try every one of it. And I said, <laughs> well, you're going to kick your ass because you could have started sixty years sooner. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he babysit Carl Perkins because they were all alcoholics and then he babysit Johnny Cash who was the biggest pill head in yeah. Nashville at that time yeah. and so uh, he babysit a lot of, a lot of groups wow a lot, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of cats so how how hard living was the were the bands that you had like your crew back in the 50s like were you was it pretty hard party in nights or no were, you know you what guys? I, back then, I had some pretty pretty strict rules, but and, and besides, they didn't smoke or drink anyway. Okay, you know, they were we was about the cleanest cut band in the world up until the seventies. Did did you have to um, did you have to like crack the whip or just nobody was really into it? No, nobody was really into it. I didn't have to. That was our rules anyway. Everybody agreed. You know, they 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 knew you couldn't come to work because they'd seen too many bands. You know, come to work drinking and uh -huh. mess up and all that stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. so we were trying. Canada was the promised land for us because okay. uh, we could stay in one spot for a week or two or three, yeah. and and they had rules up there. We thought we were coming to a, a primitive, you know, country. Diamond Helm, who is Levon Helm's dad, said, "Boys." Watch it up there in Canada. He said, they'll stick a knife in you for a dime. And, and he's never been out of Phillips County. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So so when you first got booked up in Canada by by uh, Harold Cudlitz, yeah. did it just seem totally mysterious? Like, did you know why you were going up there? Or, or like, No, we went up there for a job. Yeah, because yeah. Because we, we were paying anywhere they'd let us. 
back yeah. then. Okay. And uh, some friends of ours had been up there. Billy Lee Riley had played a week or two here. And, and then Harold Jenkins, who and Harold changed his name in Canada, Conway Twitty. He and Jack Nance, his, his drummer at the time, wrote Only Make Believe in the Fisher Hotel in right. Hamilton. And so do you remember where the, what the first gig would have been that you would have done in Ontario? I sure do. It was, it was Hamilton. Oh, okay. The Golden Rail in Hamilton. Uh-huh. And it was a, I think we made 400 a week for the whole band. And we stayed in the Fisher Hotel there. Uh-huh. It was $20 a week for a room, I remember. It was, in the, it was up there in the attic. Yeah. And Satan couldn't have stayed in that room in the summer. <laughs> <Really? It's so laughs> the, first, the first thing the boys bought was a little old fan. Yeah. With, with a paycheck. Uh-huh. But, the, but, the, but the Golden Rail was something else. We pulled in. And I don't know if you know Hamilton or not, but there's a million one-way streets there. Yeah, man, the hammer. I know it well. And, and we got lost, man. We, we could see the club, but we couldn't get couldn't to get it. couldn't get there. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, Levon said, do, do they speak speak English and everything? We didn't know nothing about Canada. Right. And so, oh, yeah, they speak English in Canada. Yeah. But we passed by one of them open farmer's markets. Yeah. And everybody was speaking a foreign language because they're from all over the world, you know. Sure, and, yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, my God, we're in trouble. <laughs> they're, they're not, they don't speak English. But anyway, we got to the, what I say the club was. Or, the Golden Rail. Golden Rail, that's yeah. it. My mind's gone this morning. We set up, and there was about seven people. Oh, man. Uh, in that club when we started. Yeah. And the first song we kicked off, they jumped up and ran out. Really? <laughs> so, oh, my God. And I heard the club owner calling Harold Cutler saying, get these hillbillies out of here. Really? They've run, they run all my crowd off. Oh, no. You know? And, boy, we were in trouble. I knew Harold said, well, as soon as I can find another band for you, we'll take them out. Yeah. But I had a friend that I had met with Harold Jenkins in my club in the uh, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dallas Harms was his name. Yeah. And he was a musician, songwriter, and everything. And he said, when we come to Hamilton, he'll get a, bu- a bunch of people together on the weekend and come down and see us. Uh-huh. <clears throat> well, I called him, SOS, and said, uh, they're, they're going to r- run us gonna, if we don't get a few people in this club yeah. tomorrow, which was, was Tuesday, right? Okay. And, and he said, I'll bring a few people. And he brought about 60 people. Wow. Well, they hadn't had that many people in that club since World War II. Oh, really? So he, so he was thrilled. And so then the club owner said, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe you know, we'll either give them a day or two more. Yeah. And, of course, it, it, that music went over real good, uh-huh. and, and it just built from there. Oh, it, wow. Okay. It, it was lined up by the weekend, which had never been. And everywhere we played in Canada was the same thing. Wasn't really? anybody there on a Monday, but by, by Thursday or Friday, it was lined up. Right. So, so I, that was the music going over real good, and that uh-huh. band was super good, too, for what it was, or, you know, a rockabilly. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in Ontario, you would get these, like, six-night or seven-night-a-week gigs. Was that something that you weren't able to get back in Arkansas? Oh, oh no, in Arkansas, it was just one night, some honky tonk somewhere in Leeds. Right. And in and, and, uh, Ontario, we could play a week or two weeks at a time. Two weeks? Oh, yeah, that, well, we started that. In fact, later on, we were so hot that uh, I could stay in the winter. I didn't like to travel. We could stay three months straight in the winter time in, in, wow. in two or three different areas. Yeah. And nobody had ever done that before, but that's how good the band was. Wow. The band was super good. Yeah. Uh, after Hamilton, did you go straight to Toronto after that? Like, did you start playing the cock door around yeah, that Yeah, we went to, we went to uh, a club there. Uh, what was the name of the club where I met you? I'm trying to think. It wasn't, it wasn't the cock door. The cock door was a... Was uh, oh, the Cock Door was the second place I played. Really? Okay. But, but we just played there uh, one week, and that was it. And then Harold booked us into to a club where we brought the twist later on in uh, Concord, the Concord Tavern. Okay. And it, it, we stayed there t- t- two or three years, you know, because the, we, we we brought the twist in from New York, and it went over real good for two or three years. So mm-hmm. we were lining them up there for two or three years b- because of the twist. Did you make any recordings while you were in Canada at that point? Or? Oh, oh, yeah, well, we, we, we didn't make any in Canada yet, but uh, we, were, we tried, what was it, Quality Records. Can you remember Quality Records? No. It was a label, that only label I reckon at that time in Canada, because all the other companies were from the States, yeah. and, and that's where I kind of got in trouble, because they were taking all the money out of Canada right. and taking it back to the States and not putting a penny in any Canadian artist. Yeah, right. And at that time, which was good for us, I shouldn't have done it, but at that time, the club owners didn't want to book any Canadian acts in, in Canada. They said, Canadian people won't come out 
to see Canadians in, right. you know, in Canada. They want, they want exotic. I said, I said, I don't think that goes for hockey, does it? <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that was good. But, yeah. but, I, but, there was, but the band started getting better and better. Yeah. They, they, they went into rock and belly rock and roll when we first came up here, and that's what gave us a, good jobs and good crowds. Yeah. And so pretty soon after you came to Ontario, um, Robbie Robertson started hanging out with you, I guess, and eventually mo- moved down to Arkansas to kind of try out for your band. But do you remember meet- meeting him for the first time? Oh, yeah. His, his mother was still living with a Mr. Robertson. That's okay. That was Robbie's stepdad. Yeah. yeah Robbie's I, I just, real dad's name is Clagerman. Yeah, yeah. I just read his book, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm. He's half Indian. He was born on Indian reservation. I know. His mama was Indian, and she yeah. was a little beautiful lady, and helped the band a lot. She let him stay there in her house, and she fed him and everything. Yeah, you know, she yeah. was something else. But Robbie came along. Uh, he went on bass first. Yeah, right. Because we'd lost our bass player. Okay. And uh, he, he, he wanted a job so bad with us, he'd try anything. Yeah, he's he sort of like he talks about how he moved down to Arkansas. He came down. We we called without him. even it, having the gig, right? Oh yeah, he, he, I said come down. Well, he was kind of a roadie for us for a little bit. He's, okay. He can't remember that he says now, but <laughs> <laughs> I paid him fifty a week, yeah. and, he, and he ran errands for us and practice. That's what I did with a bunch of musicians. They'd come in, listen to our records, play yeah. along with them, and then I, back then we rehearsed a couple hours every night, or five days a week. Yeah. Because I didn't want anybody. Everybody was would, would have gone partying yeah. if they hadn't. So. Wow, so you you ran a tight ship. It was a tight ship for a long, long time. Yeah. And uh, and then later on, many, many years later, the, they got tired of that. And then <laughs> I, I I kept them. Uh, they they couldn't bring their number one girlfriends, uh, or in uh, in the club. Yeah. Especially on weekends. And uh, and Ricky Danko said that's the reason they left. They you know had too many strict rules. <laughs> but what it was is it was a club manager and and the waiters. A bunch of girls coming in, their girlfriends, and sat down at the best table in the house and order one beer and six straws. Yeah, you can't have that, man. You can't have that because the waiter, that's how he makes his money. Yeah, yeah. His, his tips and stuff. Right. And so they were on my ass, and so I just said, you can't bring them in. Yeah. But that finally pissed okay. Ricky off, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I was going to fine him $50 because I was supposed to have gone somewhere, and he slept his girl in. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what do you remember about how the how the band, how the Hawks evolved into being that lineup with with Rick Danko and Richard Manuel and eventually Garth? Uh, was well, it was kind of gradual, you, right? As as the Arkansas boys would get married, that's what ruined most of the group. They, they'd have to go home to their girlfriends and, oh, okay. when they get married, or they'd be pregnant or something other. Yeah. And of course, the women would eventually say, "Well, say your me or music." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's either me or music, because right. because they couldn't afford to take them with. We weren't making enough money where they could keep two people going, you know. Yeah, of course. And so I, I, I came, I went to leave on. I said, leave on you. What I'm going to do? But because the, the Canadian musicians were starting to get you know, much better by then. I mean, they were they were practicing and playing, and mm-hmm. they had two or three little bands that I used to tell the club owners they were from Arkansas. Loan them my car. And they would pull in in that Arkansas car and set up and go over real good. And then about you know a month later they'd say, "Oh, that's from Canada." It was okay then because they proved they could bring people right, in. Right, right. So, so anyway, I said, "I'm going to put a Canadian. I'm going to put the best bar band ever assembled in Canada." We knew all these musicians from little bands. Richard Manuel was from Stratford, and he had a little group that I helped out quite a bit. Took him to Arkansas and everything. Called the Stratotones. Okay. And and he he was a singer. He could sing. He wasn't that great on piano yet, but uh-huh. uh, he, he had a throat. That I wish I could do that stuff and, yeah, and couldn't. Yeah, he's an incredible you know? singer, man. He was. An he was amazing. unbelievable. He never. Yeah. Nobody ever ever knew Hardy how good he could really sing. Oh man. When when they left me, I thought they was going to put him out to sing. They were the best rhythm and blues band, white rhythm and blues band, probably in the world at that time. Mm-hmm. So I thought they was going to put out some of that funky rhythm and blues on the right. first record. Yeah. It, when they brought the, when Robbie and them brought the record to my house and played it for me, I couldn't believe it. You yeah. know, the, all them songs, I liked it, but I said, I don't know if this is going to go over or not for this kind of country, <laughs> kind of this and yeah. that yeah. and the other, but it, I liked it, you know. What was what was Richard Manuel's role in in your band originally? Like, did you did you need a, a real like a, a really good singer like that? We, well, I just I was trying to see we staying in one spot a lot because I didn't like to travel, you know, except if you had a record or something out. Mm-hmm. So you had to keep changing the band. Yeah, and we had we had just lost the best piano player to this day, a rock and roll piano player on the planet, Stan Celeste. That was Stan Celeste. Yeah, man. 
from, from Buffalo. Every keep every PNL player you talk to, including the Ellis's, said he was the best. That left he had two right yeah, hands. They, he was like Oscar Peterson. He was the best, and he had to go back because of a woman naturally, you know. And he he left, and that was about the same time that Rebel Payne, who had been in his band mm -hmm. in uh, Buffalo. We hired the two of them at the same time. They were both leaving because of women okay. eventually. Yeah. Uh, Rebel stayed, uh, you see, he gave me a three-month notice when we was in Grand Bend, and that's when I auditioned and brought in Ricky Danko. Mm -hmm. Ricky Danko had his own band. He, they, they were about 17 or 18 years old. They were all young, yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, we hired him, and then we got Richard after Stan left. And so uh, then... Uh, then I, we, we, uh, let's see, who else was there in there? Garth Hudson, I, I hired as a teacher. Right, yeah, because his parents wouldn't let him go, right? Uh, no, his parents, didn't, he couldn't tell anybody he was playing in a rock and roll band <laughs> because he had the best jazz and classical bands, you know, in that area in London, Ontario, and around. So how did you guys, like, how did you guys run into him if he wasn't on the scene? Well, they used to come in the bar to see us because his oh. bands wasn't drawing enough people to have a game of tag. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I mean, he, they were great, but nobody would, was going to see him. Okay. So I, I, I thought, well, maybe because he was school and he was yeah. he 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 could actually be a teacher. Yeah. I mean, he could he could talk. And he looked like uh, it too. Yeah, and he he knew boy Garth till this day. Uh, he's different. I don't understand him yet, but he knew music, boy. He is I mean, different. He, and, yeah. and he talked. Nobody like Garth. He taught the band uh, a lot of music. Yeah. And they really. Like I said, they got so good in one year that uh, they shot by me musically like a bolt of lightning. He was a little older than them, too, right? Yes, he was. He, Garth is my age. Okay. Garth is my age, and uh, and they were younger, you know. But uh, they they got to getting good, and going, and they were all good-looking young kids, you know, that had oh. personalities. And that's yeah. what I was looking for, right. for a bar. Yeah. Because, see, a bar ain't, ain't like a, you could be the greatest musician in the world, like, mm -hmm. like David Foster and them, and not go over in a yeah. bar. Yeah. I mainly brought him in for Richard Manuel, because Richard, you know, didn't know actually what he was doing real good. But he, <laughs> from his mother, was a piano player, and he'd uh -huh. learned a lot of stuff. It was his throat yeah. singing. That that I went and, and I said he he learn the stuff yeah. eventually because that's what I did with every new member I'd hire them they wouldn't play but <clears throat> they would stay you know at the hotel or somewhere and practice along with our records yeah. for a couple of hours a day and then practice on their own yeah. then they'd practice two hours with us at night when we practice right. so they'd get good and they got good <laughs> and that, that uh, is how you get good. That's how you get good. It's, it's practice. Yeah, man. That's all it is. You, you know, I, I actually had it for me. I'm the, I was the slowest one, of course, in the band, and I needed to practice more than anybody else because I was slow. <laughs> but I didn't tell them that. <laughs> so what, what what was the circuit like? Like once you picked that band up, like and you had all those Canadian guys, you weren't just staying in Canada. You were still going all through the States as well, right? Well, I was playing everywhere they'd let us, but mainly it was still our, our main bread and butter was still Canada. Okay. But I, I still kept my little gigs together in the South. We played Texas and Arkansas yeah. and Tennessee and little Louisiana, little places like that. But mainly they were just one-nighters. Right, okay. We, we were mainly playing for fraternities and sororities really? where they had university towns. Oh, okay. They were booking us yeah. because we were still, that music was still young, you know, yeah. I mean, pretty young, uh, rock and roll and rockabilly. Yeah, yeah, and 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 in Canada, were you going west of Ontario at all, or was it all? Oh yeah, we played all the way to Vancouver and oh, back. We did really, okay. Yeah, and all the way to Newfoundland and back. Holy shit, yeah. man! We played all them little honky tonks. Well, we yeah. got pretty pretty famous there for a little while. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, um, for a bar. I mean, we were still a bar act, but but we was getting more airplay than anybody else. You know, and, yeah. and because we were going over good, that band <clears throat> went over super good because. They all had personalities. Yeah. They all looked good, and they all played good and sung good. And uh, they uh, see in a bar, like I said, it's a, it's a different gig. You, you got to you know go out and mix with the people and shake hands and thank them and have them come back and all yeah. that shit yeah, you yeah, got to do yeah. to stay in the bar, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were really really good at it. And the women really went for this band. They dug and them. once you got 200 women coming in to see the band, yeah. you got 400 guys coming in to hustle the women. <laughs> totally. And that's just the way it is. That's simple mathematics, man. That's simple mathematics there. Yeah, yeah. And so we kept them going and lined them up for, you know, two or three years. You know, it, uh -huh. was, a, it was a strong unit. 
and then of course they they were too musical for they they got too good to wow. put past simple music so so when, were, when 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 you guys made singles like i know you you recorded those two songs that robbie wrote for you hey baba lou and some yeah like yeah he was about 16 years old yeah those are cool tunes actually and i liked them you know anything i liked i tried to do you know yeah but we were do, practicing so much that and playing so much that he didn't have time to write too much when we was playing on, on the road. Yeah, it seemed he like was he was writing songs when he was 15, 16 years old. Robbie yeah, was. It seemed like he wrote those those songs for you and then kind of like didn't really write much again until the band was doing their thing at Big Pink. But um, well, so well because we practiced and played all the time, he didn't right. have enough time to sit down and write too yeah, much. Yeah. He probably wrote a few songs, uh -huh. but he was writing when he was young with different bands and stuff. You yeah. know, it was because of his mama that we brought Robbie in anyway. He, she came in the club with. The, his stepdad uh -huh. a couple times a week and she said she had a son that played music and she was afraid he was going to get in trouble uh -huh. because they were skipping out on hotel bills and stuff like that at right. the time and, and, and the little bands and so she was such a nice lady she finally would well, you give him a chance just to listen to him and said I, I, I will uh -huh. and Robbie came in you know he was a big tall skinny good looking kid yeah. and he played guitar good but he, he, he couldn't play some of our stuff yeah. but he listened to the, the, the the new stuff, kind of, and he and he was good. Yeah, but, uh, and, it, keen, it took and him, keen to learn. And he came to learn, right? And that right. was it. Right. So when we had a chance, uh, because of the way he looked and acted, and wanted it so bad, I, I called him and, and brought him into Arkansas when we was getting ready to rehearse down there. Yeah, that, that was when uh, J uh, the other bass player we had, Lefty Evans, was his name. Uh -huh. He he wanted to stay in Arkansas. Okay. So we brought Robbie in, and he started practicing bass and did pretty good because he looked good. Yeah. And he and he could show a little bit, you know. Uh -huh. And he studied guitar under Jimmy Ray Palman. Okay. That was the first one, and, and, and he learned a lot. Yeah. The other guitar player I brought in was Fred Carter. Yeah. And he was unbelievable. And then the other guitar was... Uh, Roy. What, what did I say? Uh, Roy Buchanan. Uh, Roy Buchanan, yeah. that's it. Man. And uh, and so he learned a lot from those guys. And, and we were playing in Grand Band, Ontario, for the summer. Yeah. And that's when Robbie started to get right. He started. He knew all the licks. Uh -huh. He just wasn't putting them together where they said too much at the time. You know, it's like yeah. when he did Bo Diddley, that's just licks. That's not really right. saying something. But they were yeah. great licks. If you yeah. ever hear it, I heard it not too long ago on a good system, and boy, it, it sounds it good. Actually, yeah, man. The, the, the music could make it today. Yeah, because yeah. he he was he was ahead of his time yeah. doing that wild stuff, that wild sound. Yeah, you know. Do you remember the the sessions that you did for those two songs of his, Hey Baba Lou? Like, do you remember the? Yeah, the they points? were in New they were in New York, New York, and, yeah. and the reason I did them is uh, because we'd finish. See, we weren't like the other band. We'd learn the songs mm -hmm. and play them for a month or two or three right. before so, we went in to record. So you could so record we could finish fast. a session. We could do four or five songs a session because yeah. it was down. Right. And then I had extra time, yeah. and, I, and that's when I decided to do a couple of writers just to see what it would do, yeah. and that's how they got recorded. I can remember a little bit of a song. Hey, Baba Lou was the name. Yeah. She don't love me, but I loved her just the same. Uh, treat yeah. me mean, treat me cruel, treat me just like I was a fool. Hey. Hey, Babalu, and I, you know, I like the song. It's a minor key, and I like, I like the minor keys that back then. Yeah, it was, yeah. And, and then I heard that uh, that Morris Levy uh, demanded some co-write credits on those songs. Well, I think he put his name on it. Yeah, I, I used to joke, Robbie. Robbie was you know when he, when he became the biggest writer in the country there for a little while with the band. Yeah, and, and we had an interview or, or something, and we was talking, and he said, Yeah, he. He wrote some songs back then. Hey, Bob. I said, yeah, but you had help. You had Morris Levy. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Morris, <laughs> Morris couldn't write a note. He just stole everything. Yeah. Oh, my God. So w w was the was the the business side of it, like with the, the whole Morris Levy scene, was it like what you hear? Like, were they real just gangsters? Well, they were gangsters, okay. But in my case... You know, I, I heard all kinds of other acts saying he, he stole all their money. Mm -hmm. But in my case, he took a liking to me, Morris did. Okay. And he and he showed off. And he owned everything. He owned the round table. He owned uh, Birdland. He owned uh, all okay. that jazz stuff. Yeah. He owned Alan Freed. <laughs> really? He, 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 yeah, he paid for Alan Freed's debts. And, oh, and that's how okay. come I got on the Alan Freed shows. You know, that was the luckiest break we oh, could so have. He, he, really, he really did own Alan Freed. <laughs> Yes, he owned him. I mean, wow. well, he, he, Alan would do just about anything he'd say because he told Alan to put me on his shows, yeah. and he did. Yeah. 
Okay. And he and, and he had the and that's where we met so many acts. He got, Alan Freed started playing the black music uh-huh. before anybody else that I know of did. Yeah, yeah. He and, did. and he had those great great shows. That's where I met Bo Diddley, uh-huh. and Jackie Wilson was the headliner. He was a really? showman like a. Like Michael Jackson. He's Michael incredible, Jackson's man. Yeah. Got a lot of his stuff off of Jackie Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember hanging out with those guys much? Like him well, I didn't hang out with the... the, the uh, it was Memphis mm. and, uh, yeah, where I hung out with all the guys. Okay. That when I got to New York, I, I hung out with a few of them, but they were big time, and we was in many others, you know? Yeah. But uh, that's where I met Bo and started hanging out with him. Met Jackie, and we ran around a little bit, but we weren't like buddies where we went to, to bars together and stuff uh-huh. like that. Yeah. Now, now, but I met a lot of great people. Oh, just about everybody. Jimmy Reed. Really? Maybe J- Jimmy Reed. All them great black acts was on Alan Freed's shows. Do you remember hanging out with Jimmy Reed much? Not much, but uh-huh. I remember uh, he, I, he, he was kind of like Johnny Cash or, or Carl Perkins was at the time. He, he was in the booze every day. Yeah, Jimmy drank a lot, man. He, he drank a lot. Like, you guys were touring a lot and making pretty good money, I guess, like at the, at the clubs and doing those long stints. Were you actually making... We were doing, you know, as good as bars paid back yeah, then, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Harold cut this. We finally got eight hundred and fifty dollars a week. I can remember that. That's pretty good. I can't good. remember anything, but I can remember a few things. That's pretty and, good. And for he said, well, "The bands ain't never going to pay any more than that." Yeah. But we got so good, and the competitions got good with other band, uh, yeah. other bars that that we ended up probably being the highest paid bar band in Canada at that time. Uh huh. And were you making any money off the records as well, or was that just no, like, no, that we was didn't vanishing? get any time. I don't think I ever got a. Uh, uh, but but what I did with with everybody was talking about Morris Levy, yeah. he liked me and he took me everywhere and bought me things and did all this stuff. So I'll bet you if uh, all the, everything I sold was added up and I got paid for everything, uh-huh. I, I'd still owe him money <laughs> because he put <laughs> he put a lot of money in. So he bought them big ads and cash box and billboard and okay. put me here and took me there and yeah. gosh we had. At the round table, he was the first one, and he owned the Peppermint Lounge, which started the twist. Oh, okay. That was a club in New York? Yeah. And uh-huh. we were playing the club, and, and we saw how it was rich people and movie stars and everybody coming in for that twist. That's how it hit. Mm. So I talked Mr. Jack Fisher at the Concord and let me bring it in and try it in Canada. And, of course, it worked. For three or four years, It was a, they lined up it on Mondays. It was hot. And then that, right after that, it was the go-go. We brought the go-go down to the cock door. Okay. And, we, and that's why we got to stay there a long time, because there's something about a, a, a girl in, in a cage that I, I even like to sit every now. I don't know why, but I like to see a woman in a cage now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they got to... They were able to take more and more and more clothes off over, over the time. Sure, you know? yeah. And so finally, they got. Did Did you have those girls in your traveling band, or would you just pick some girls up from the from? Toronto well, sometimes or? we took girls, and sometimes they had them there. Oh, okay. Be- because girls could make shit. They could make a hundred dollars a week dancing, you know, and that was yeah. a lot of money then uh-huh. for, for for girls. Sure. But, but we got some beauties, and that that became strong for I guess at least three years. And uh, and then that started fading down a little bit, and that's when we shifted into the the go go hit. Okay, and what and what about radio hits and stuff at that time? Did you have much going on airplay? Yeah, we, we 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 got a lot of radio play because, uh, but I didn't sell. Like I said, I didn't sell millions and millions of records. If if I got paid for every record I got, I probably wouldn't made enough money to pay for the liner notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you never but, know. Uh, like I bet you sold more records than you think. Well, I was, we were getting airplay. That was the main thing. Yeah, and yeah. people didn't know. I was getting more airplay in the Beatles when they came out in the 60s. And, and <laughs> nobody, the people that's listening to the radio, you know, if you're getting paid that much, they think you must be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So that lineup, like the, the, the classic Hawks band lineup, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, everyone thinks of it as just such a, such a great chemistry, um, you know. Uh, but it, was, it was. It was the best bar band, in my opinion, ever assembled to this day. Because they could all mix. Yeah. They were all young. Yeah. They were all above average in the music. Yeah. And God taught them how to be even bigger. And it became a super strong band. And was it quick? Or like, did, did it take a while for them to kind of feel each other out and get to know yeah. how to play About together? a year. Okay. About a year because we, of our practice. See, we practiced five or six hours you know, a week at least. Yeah. And then we played every night. Yeah. And, then, uh, and we practiced a lot. And the ones who were learning... 
practice two hours on their own, mm-hmm. listen to records uh, in, in their hotel rooms and stuff. That was one of the rules. Okay. Ricky Danko, I used to have him in grand bands when I brought him in, yeah. and I had him practice in front of a mirror. Really? You see him say, and he learned those dance steps until the day he died, he was still doing those dance steps. <laughs> like socially, were you hanging out with all of them equally, or were you, were you well, sort well, of treated like for, a... Well, for, for a long time, you see, until I got married. Uh-huh. And then I hung out with my wife a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they would, and they would move. We, I gave her the nickname Mama Coach. That was Robbie's mama. Robbie's because mama. Because yeah. that's how it got started, and that's how it was. And uh, they became very, very big. I mean, they could have been probably the biggest band in the world. They outdone the Eagles if it hadn't been for drugs. Yeah, and and was that something that was seeping into the the Hawks at all, or did, did, not in my band at not, all? Not not at they all. They were clean as a whistle in my band. Even but a few years later, three or four years later, yeah. with all that shit, and they stopped practicing. Yeah, right. Shit, you know, a young man when he's got money and doesn't have to work, what does he do? Chase women, party, and get into things. Yeah, and that's what happened. Yeah, it ruined the best band in the world was uh, yeah. the drugs. Yeah. So when they left you, um, it was pretty sudden, right? Like, did, were they just gone all of a sudden, or or did you? Was well, it no, st- I knew it was coming because uh-huh. they had they had had uh, offers. I mean, this band was so good. Every band and every star in the world, or semi star, was offering them jobs. Uh-huh. But I didn't want to travel, and so right, they could make right. more money by going at the one nighters. But you don't save any money; how it costs you too much yeah. on the road. And that's when bands break up, with all that wear and tear, and yeah. being on every night, and you know, take pills to make them feel better, and all that shit. That's what happens. When they left, how quickly did you turn around and get a new group of uh, of guys together? Well, I already knew a group. Robbie Lane and the Disciples was a group that I was helping out a little bit anyway. Mm-hmm. And they were a pretty good little young band. They were just gotten out of high school. Yeah. And they looked good and played good. And I hired them. And I got them a, a couple of jobs. John Bassett Jr. was mm-hmm. a real good friend of mine. Yeah. And he had that they owned the radio stations oh. and, and, and TV stations. Okay. Uh, CTV. Yep. They owned yep. CTV at that time. Wow, okay. The Bassett's and the Eatons, uh-huh. John Eaton and them, young, the young, and they, the young boys used to come in the bars all the time. You know, they that, that was their age and their music at that time. Yeah, and I got them a job <clears throat> on a TV show called "It's Happening," and then a Go Go '66, and they were good-looking kids too. They uh-huh. weren't as strong musically okay. as uh, as the band, but they could play that commercial music, which I was doing anyway. The right. stuff that was on the radio, they. They played, and I just still did my same old shit. Okay. So in, uh, I know in, in 1970, you made that, uh, there's a really cool record that you made in Muscle Shoals with Tom Dowd and Jerry Wexler with the Oh, that was an experience. I could tell you, I could tell you days about how much fun I had with them. They were, <clears throat> they were big time. What were some highlights for you? And we put out that one song yeah. called Down in the Alley. Yeah. And Dwayne Allman was playing that slide on, you know. Yeah, man. And that was the one that John Lennon, Promoted. I've got I got an ad for, of John Lennon promoting it. Like you know, really. And and he didn't even do that for the Beatles. That's when John and Yoko were living with me on, on Mississauga Road. Yeah. What the hell? How did that happen? Well, I don't know. The the the, the, the journalist that got us started was uh, Richie York. He just died uh-huh. a week or two ago. Oh. Uh, lungs, you know, smoking and everything. Yeah. But he was the head writer for the Rolling Stone magazine. Okay. At that time, and he gave us a three page write up, and every label, that's the, the, the Rolling Stone was as strong as the Bible in yeah. those days. Yeah. And every record label in the United States offered me a gig after I got those write ups. So it, th- those were reviews of the record that you made at Muscle Shoals? Well, that was all the early stuff. Okay. Uh, we got we when we weren't selling that many records, but nobody knew that because we were getting airplay. We was getting more airplay than the Beatles, I think. Yeah, yeah. In, in Canada, right? I'm just curious how John Lennon ended up living at your house. Oh yeah, well, uh, Richie York. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it was Richie York yeah. because he did interviews on everybody and wrote books on everybody. Led Zeppelin before they were ever known. And yeah, bunch yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I imagine. I mean, I'm just guessing. I didn't know he never did tell me, but they called me. Mm-hmm. from England and asked if they, they could stay at my house because they had found out that I lived just a little ways out of Toronto right. on Mississauga Road then and they didn't want to stay in any more hotels. They'd already been through with the bed-ins and stuff like that, I think. Yeah. 
Um, and and f- did you know John Lennon from before? Or did, no, did he, no, he I didn't know him you, at all. He just called you out of the blue? I didn't know him at all, but he knew the songs. He knew my songs. Wow, <laughs> He'd heard cool. them in England, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so I, let, me, let me tell you how powerful that that bunch was. In Toronto at that time, it took you a month or sometimes longer to get a telephone put into your new apartment, right? Yeah. They made a deal on Saturday. Sunday morning, they put 16 lines across, the, <laughs> across my fields and up into my house. <laughs> And so I knew then money and Fame. and celebrities had had a little uh, had a little power. Yeah, and, and, and Yoko, she could talk to anybody in the world, man. She was talking to Princess Margaret, to Holy Peter shit. Sellers, to the ambassador of Japan. You know, she could speak about six, seven languages. She was a super smart lady. I mean, I I, I couldn't understand her, but uh, she was uh, something yeah. else. Yeah. And John was just a good old boy, you know. Um, how long did did they live with you for? Two weeks. Wow. And did you did play any music, or did he write any songs? Not much. He, 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 he was writing on that, that one great song that he, that he had out and changed it around while he was at my house. Uh, what was that one, one song they play everywhere of John's? Uh, well, there's a lot of them. <laughs> I know, but this one is the biggest. Uh, uh, Imagine? Imagine. That's oh, okay. it. That's it. Wow, okay. He, he was working on that song there. Wow. And, uh, and also, we, <clears throat> we got a chance to go in, and uh, he, he, he went to... They were starting a peace festival. Right. Oh, that 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 big show in Toronto. <clears throat> yeah. They they booked a whole big private car on the train, and Wanda and myself, my wife and me, went with, and John and Yoko lived in this big, big two apartment train car. I mean, like they used to really? make in the old days. You know what a place. We had twenty four hour day cooks, had everything. Wow. And and they just pulled that tra- uh, the, the car up, unhook it, and then from there they'd come and get us in limousines. Wow, crazy! And so we met Trudeau. We met everybody. Wow! And nice. and uh, they were going to have that big festival. Trudeau was going to furnish the military for security, yeah. but everything was supposed to be free. Okay. And then some of, some of the people started, you know, gouging for money. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of got out got out of hand, got you know. Hand. Right. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me a bit about making that record in Muscle Shoals, like um, working with Dwayne Allman and working with the Swampers, what that was like? Oh, yeah, you know, the Muscle Shoals boys had already had a big reputation because of Aretha Franklin and all them other superstars that Wilson they had Kick hits on. And, yeah, no, no all kidding. them great ones. Yeah. But what they had done is when they were young, <clears throat> younger, they were young men, yeah. and in a band, they used to play Southern Love, they said a lot of mine, they, when they were playing in the bars and stuff through the South. Oh, okay. And, and I knew Dwayne Allman before it was the Allman Brothers. It was another name back then. I can't remember what it was right now. but The Hourglass. I think that's what it was, maybe. Yeah. God, you, well, you know more about this shit than I do. <laughs> you, I should be interviewing you. <laughs> but Dwayne, they used to come up and ask me for my autographs and stuff like that, you know. Really? And, yeah, and so when I told Jerry Waxer, yeah. I'd really like to use Dwayne Allman because I love that slide guitar he did. Yeah. Uh, if he could play on the session, yeah. and Jerry said, "Well, I don't. We we'll last, but I don't think he can come." Because they were already becoming big stars by then. Oh, so this and is I'll, this was after he'd done his stint at Muscle Shoals. This is like the Allman Brothers were already together, I guess. Oh yeah, they were already doing good. Oh okay. They were big time, and and also he was really popular. Right. Yeah. You, you know. And so and Dwayne so, uh, Dwayne agreed to come in and play with you. That's yeah. Cool. When he, he, he Jerry and, and Tom was shocked. But, but because of the early days, at yeah. one time, that little band, Wayne came up and asked me for my autograph. <laughs> that is so cool. I couldn't believe that. That's something. Not too many people are going to believe that. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's um, amazing. This, this is before the Armin Brothers. This is about other little band. Uh-huh. But anyway, and the, and the Muscle Shows Boys was the same thing. They were a band, and they used to play some of my stuff, he said. So they were, the South. they were, they were excited. It was a big deal for them to play with you, probably at that. Well, point. Well, I tell you what, I, you know, I was, it was exciting for me, but I didn't know that. But that, that's what they told me. And it, I could tell you two days of stories about what, what happened in Muscle Shoals because you know Jerry Wexler, you know, down in the alley. Yeah. Jerry Wexler had produced the original mm-hmm. several years before a black group yep. that had done down in the alley. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that at the time, but he brought it up during the session. Okay. I, I, I like that song, and, and Wayne put it, uh, well, the, the slide is what sold the, the song, I think. Yeah. But John Lennon heard it, and he liked it, and he did a promotion. We have it today. We never did release it, but I, we have John Lennon talking about me and uh, down in the alley. Amazing. 
Um, and so you, you mentioned there's tons of stories. Can you give me a highlight or two from that from that from Muscle Shoals recording? Oh yeah, well, I, I, one of the great things is you know, I went. To, I'd heard all about the wildness and stuff down there. Yeah. And I had a, I had a friend of mine, a millionaire friend, David Dunlap. Have you heard of the Dunlaps? No. They were a big name, like the Eatons and that. Okay. Dunlap's uh, David Dunlap's father, grandfather founded Hollinger Mines. Okay. And and that was the biggest mines in the world. I still is in Canada, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And so they were rich. Okay. And he had his own plane. He could fly and do everything. Very super cat. And so I said, "Well, we're going down. To, I better take." So I took a I took a case of Crown Royal <laughs> <laughs> to show off, and I took a. Uh, I, 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 I took more pills than Ozzy Osbourne knew about, <laughs> and and grass because yeah. BC was getting a real good reputation sure. as the best grass in the world uh-huh. at that time. Yeah, and then when I got off the plane and and I said we had to unload this stuff, a couple of the boys. Well, it was Roger Hawkins was the name of uh, the drummer. I think. Yes, yep. I can't remember names and anything anymore. Yes. David Hood. David Hood was on bass, and yeah. but they came to the airport to pick me up. And, and when they saw saw what I had there to load, boy, they got in a hurry because Muscle Shoals, <laughs> the whole area is dry. Right. County. Yeah. I think it it's still a dry is. County. You're not supposed to have nothing in there, whiskey or nothing. Right. And the only way you could get a drink is go to the state line and buy it off of the sheriff's brother. Really? That's exactly what it was. <laughs> so you show up with a plane load of Crown Royal. I and, came up with all and that BC stuff. Weed and my and... God, it scared them to death. <laughs> It scared them absolutely to death. Oh but everybody sampled everything finally. Uh-huh. Jerry Waxer and Tom Dowd both smoked grass. Yeah. But they never smoked together. Oh, wow. And that's weird. And they, and they couldn't fly together because they couldn't lose both of them, I guess, if the plane went down. Whoa, that's heavy. They were, they were you know, something else. Yeah. And Jerry, we, we had a ball. I, f- I fixed Jerry up with one of the best looking women in Canada, man. He, really? <laughs> and, and he took it. <laughs> Um, how long? How long were you down there working on that album for? Was it just a couple of days, or were you there? No, for... no, we was there. I guess a week or two, or three a week and a day or two. I guess. Yeah, yeah, okay. I did want to ask you about uh, doing the last waltz because that's how me and actually you know my generation of people got to know you. Um, you know, yeah, being, well, being younger. Well, that was the most exciting thing I've ever had. I really? went out. I went out about uh, almost a month early. Yeah. Just because I'd never known any of those big big names, uh-huh. I played the bars, and if they didn't come in the bars, which a lot of them did, yeah. uh, I I didn't get to see them. Yeah. So I, I I watched all the rehearsals at a place called Shangri La. That was a place that Bob Dylan and the yeah. band had for recording sessions and stuff. Yeah. It'd been an old whorehouse. Yeah. And it had rooms and all that stuff. Right. So they could people could stay there and record and yep. do everything. And so I stayed down there just to see all of them. I, I'd never seen all, all of them before. I mean, uh-huh. it, it was something else. Van Morrison, but I got a story about Van Morrison was that when he was 14, 15 years old, he's Irish. Yeah. And he had an aunt and uncle that had moved to Canada. And his mom and dad and him came to, to Canada to visit him. And they'd heard, and he was in the music then. And of course, he'd heard about the, the band being, it was the hottest band sure. in the country at that time. Yeah. And they got permission for him to come down somehow or another, and come in the bar and hear that band. Okay. And he flipped out about him. All those years later, wow. when he was on the last waltz, yeah. I couldn't even remember his name. I just remembered the incident. <laughs> I couldn't remember Van Moore. He came up, introduced himself, yeah. and told me the story. Wow. And I remembered it then, but I, did, I couldn't remember the name. But he put on a show. I mean, he, he's, he's some kind of a genius. That, that he cat. is incredible in that, yeah. Yeah, you, you, yeah you, you did a hell of a, a job, too. So was it, was it a pretty wild night there, like at Winterland, or was it uh, kind of subdued backstage, or was it a big party back there? Well, well they had, everything was going on, man. They had, they had parties. A funny story was uh, the night before, I was in Bill Graham. Yeah. He threw the biggest party going at this big place for the, everybody that's on the show. Mm-hmm. But before, this is the day, the day before. And uh, everybody was there, and so uh, the, the, some of the musicians got to getting on the stage playing, but they were playing different instruments. Uh-huh. Like Dr. John, he got yeah. on guitar. Yeah, he's a good guitar player. But Dr. John is 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 a pretty good guitar player. Yeah, yeah And I'll everybody say. was playing different instruments, and Eric Clapton got on drums. Really? And, yeah, yeah. He's playing drums and doing all this shit, but he wasn't that wasn't that wasn't that strong on drums, like you know. <laughs> he, but he wanted to play them, like yeah. Gordon Lightfoot always wanted to play drums. Yeah. But anyway, he he was playing along, and I'm just joking. Yeah. So I said, uh, I said, you better get back on the guitar uh, because you ain't ever going to 
make any money on drums. And he looked up and smiled and said, Ringo did. <laughs> that was super, super funny at oh, the time. Man. So uh, uh, in, the, in the movie, when you go on stage, you go, big time, Bill, big time. Now, uh, I've always heard that, that, that you're yelling at Bill Graham, but I've also heard that maybe... Well, it was Bill Graham and, and a tobacco farmer, Bill. Uh, here, that, that's the two bills that I knew. I didn't know uh, Bill down there, but I thought it'd work because I'm saying something to him. He was the one that was running the show. Oh, okay. He Bill was like Graham. this. Yeah. Um, but were you also talking to somebody else, or was that? Well, I had a friend up here, a tobacco farmer, that was a faithful old fan. Okay. He brought his whole family to see me play if, if I was in a hundred mile radius everywhere we played. Okay. For five generations now, they've been coming in. Awesome. <laughs> the the great great grandkids are coming in to see us when we play in that area. Okay, so that was like a salute to to Bill Graham and to that and to Tobacco yeah Bill. yeah. Well, I was going to do it for Bill, but yeah. then I thought, well, Bill Graham, it'll, it'll work both ways. He'll think it's for him, and oh, I can tell Bill it was really for him. So yeah. it worked both ways. Oh, nice. Okay, uh, I know you got to go, and and uh, yeah, and I, she's on me here because yeah, yeah no we, problem, we, man. We, we've talked half a day. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's great. I, I, I wanted to ask you some of this in-depth stuff, and I really appreciate it. Well, I told you, you a lot of time. shit, and yeah, man. about all of it, but uh, yeah. I, there's a lot more stories I could tell, but we'll do that another time. That sounds good, man. I, yeah, I really appreciate it. Ah, so great to be able to speak to somebody like that with so much history and had so much impact on popular music and rock and roll in, in such an interesting way. Hope you enjoyed listening to that, uh, and I uh, had a blast bringing it to you. I will be back next week. Please join me for another episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. Music Makers and Soul Shakers is recorded at the Hen House Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Please visit us online at www.stevedawson.ca. Thanks always to Jeremy Holmes in Vancouver for his help with research and to Michael Glusak for editing, music placement, and mixing. 